downstairs, so release them. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Good to see all your smiling faces. How many are enjoying the flowers? How many are enjoying the green grass? Oh my goodness, huh? You just want to step outside and just go, oh, the breath of God, amen? The breath of God. I remember when I was walking um, through a, a time in my life when my, my lungs were not functioning quite um, properly, um, I would just imagine the breath of God coming into my lungs. I could barely walk um, a half a block. And I just continued to walk in that. And I, and I would just, I would walk that half a block and I'd say, thank you, Jesus, that I can walk this half a block. And then pretty soon you're walking a block. And then pretty soon you're walking two blocks. Pretty soon my lungs begin to, right, gain strength. All because of his goodness and greatness. Amen. The breath of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember when, uh, just thinking of, you know, um, thinking about salvation and thinking about um, giving our life to the Lord. Uh, I, I, I don't know if anybody here has just recently given their life to the Lord. Anybody here just maybe just recently gave their life to the Lord? Meaning that you recognize that you were not going down the right path and, and you had a heart change and you gave your heart over to the Lord and you said yes to him and no to the things of this world. Anybody just recently do that? I might have you come up, so don't raise your hand. No. <laughs> Chances are I might know anyway. Um, I was thinking a little Mason man. Um, he's not so little anymore. I think he'll probably be taller than me someday. But anyway, yeah, I said, yeah, he will. Anyway, he was standing right here, and uh, he was probably seven years old, I guess, and uh, never too young to give your life to the Lord. In fact, it's a good start when you give it when you're young. Anyway, um, when he was done, he uh, prayed the prayer of whatever. He just asked the Lord into his heart, and uh, he said, Grandpa, it just felt like a weight came off my shoulders. Um, seven years old. Um, kids have weights. People have weights. And it uh, doesn't mean life gets easier, but uh, uh, life in Christ is amazing. Um, we are going to face battles, and we're going to face some uh, things that are like overwhelming sometimes. But in Christ, he's my champion. He's my deliverer. He might not deliver you out of that situation, but he'll walk you through that situation. And that's who our God is. He, we're victorious in him. He's my champion. I love that. I love that when uh, David, you can imagine just maybe scrawny little David. I don't know what David looked like, but he was young. But man, he had a fire in his bosom for the things of the Lord. And he heard the voice of the Lord. He fought the bear. He fought the lion. And when it was time to face the giant, and the giant was cursing Israel, he was cursing the children of God. And something inside of him, tenacity rose up inside of him and said, you're not going to do that to, to me. You're not going to do that to my family. You're not going to do that to us. And that little boy went out, and he took on the, the Goliath. He took on the giant. His brothers were mocking him beforehand and everything else, but something inside of him rose up and said, my God, my God, right? And that's what's so cool about having the Lord. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Amen. He's the God of the impossible. He makes things possible. Um, I've been kind of mulling through today. Well, we had, uh, it's called the Abundant Life class. We just kind of talked about some life stuff. Probably one of the best ones we had so far. You missed out. If you weren't down there, you missed out. It was wonderful. Um, I don't know if you remember Darren Scott. Anybody remember Darren Scott? Big black guy, about 6'5" about 320. <laughs> you can't miss him. His name come up. Just talking about the people that we've encountered. And uh, just so cool how God um, brings people into our midst and they minister to us and we minister to them and we get to meet different kinds of people. Amen? It's so fun. That's what we love about the fireworks booth. Uh, 
you have to be on your toes a little bit. Um, but the thing is, is there's people that come that uh, maybe their life is not well. Uh, maybe their situation is not well. Maybe their situation is well. But we strike up conversations that are just sometimes just amazing. And uh, you have to be really sensitive. Uh, you have to put down your candy bar and your pop and your blizzard once in a while to minister. But anyway, it is so fun to be able to have the opportunity to step into people's lives for a moment. Um, a couple years ago, uh, there was a lady there and her husband, they were from California. And they were up here for a, uh, they were up here for a funeral of their grandpas. And um, they said who their grandpa was and everything. And they talked about some people that were um, relations of theirs. And they're over on this side. And um, Diana Kane was actually on the other side over there. And, um, they used to play together when they were little. And they hadn't seen each other for probably about 30 years. And they had mentioned her name. Uh, this lady mentioned Diana Kane. And I said, well, you haven't seen her for about 30 years, huh? She goes, yeah. We used to play together and everything. I said, well, she's standing right over there. Striking up a conversation. Divine appointments by God. Amen? And that's so cool. Um, I always think of this, and, and I, I, I will never forget this. God just give me this picture. Um, how many would love to have like five pounds of gold right now? Yeah? If you're saying no, you don't know what the price of gold is, do you? <laughs> So you have gold, right? And it's God's word. He just gave me a picture. And this gold is like God, uh, this word of God is like gold. And you get to give it to somebody. What a privilege. Even this morning. I mean, um, I don't know if someone else maybe had a word of the Lord or not. But anyway, um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but anyway, it, it, what a, what a, um, it's almost like overwhelming, nervous, nerve-wracking. Um, when God gives you a word and you're supposed to present it. But what a privilege to be able to present that word uh, to somebody or to the congregation. You never know. You never know, right? Amen. Today we're going to talk about stewarding of his ways. We kind of went through that last week. Um, and so we're going to go through that a little bit more. I didn't get finished, but I think it's important um, that we're talking about stewarding his ways. Uh, prior weeks, I talked about stewarding his testimony. What does that mean? That means we uphold what he says about himself in the Word of God. That means that we uphold or we steward or we um, testify of who God is. So you, you're encountering somebody's life and you go, man, I don't know if God loves me. What a great opportunity to step in and say, oh, my dear friend, Jesus loves Why do I keep using you as an illustration? <laughs> You're that good. I'm just attracted to beauty or something like that. <laughs> anyway, what a privilege, right, to be able to open up the love of God. Honestly, we've, we've sensed the love of God. Even as that, that word would say, and, and we kind of kind of sh shimmer at that word, but we were wretched. Even when you were a good person, you were not a good person. <laughs> but now we are because of the love of Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ Jesus within us. And that's so amazing. Um, last week, I also talked about the mind of Christ. We are to have the mind of Christ. Um, are we to memorize the scripture? No, not necessarily. That's not what it means. But we are to think and we're to imagine as Jesus imagined. We are to uh, receive uh, truth as Jesus received truth from his heavenly Father. I know in 2 Corinthians it says this, who knows the thoughts of God but the Spirit of God. And what a privilege we have to have the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And he reminds us of the very word of Jesus. And he reminds us and brings to us the thoughts of God. That's having the mind of Christ. That's able to do the impossible. You know, sometimes we do things in our own strength. We do some things in our own um, ideas. And God is stepping us into a place of, no, there's more than that. 
Moses. <laughs> you just go, go through the Bible and just see all the things that God used mere people to do the miraculous. Moses is bowing out, man. He's at the burning bush and he's going, oh, I can't do this. But I've picked you. I've chosen you. I'll use your brother also, but man, I'm choosing you. And what a privilege. What a privilege. And here's the thing. Moses. How many know that Moses, it was not an easy road for Moses? He had a bunch of rebellious, arrogant, doubtful people. And yet he heard the word of God. And he believed the word of God. Because prayers have been prayed for over 400 years. For those children of Israel to be delivered out of bondage, to be delivered out of um, this place of slavery by the Egyptians. What a picture of what we have today. We're that Moses, right? We're bringing people, because of Christ, because of the message, because of the love of God, we're bringing people out of bondage because of Jesus and because of the Word of God. What a privilege. What an honor. What a responsibility for us to have. What a great responsibility, amen? amen? We have a generation. We have a generation of people that need to be delivered, set free, know Jesus, know the things of Him, be excited about the things of Him, right? Man, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Okay, here we go. So as we're talking about stewarding his ways, um, I think it's important that we understand his ways. And we also know that because of this scripture that um, he has displayed, he has, Jesus has came even as the radiance of his father. So prophets of old, right, only prophesied of Jesus. They, pro they didn't even get to see Jesus, yet they prophesied of him. And they were searching for him. So I, I've been thinking about this just recently. We kind of talked about it a little bit downstairs as well. But um, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Right? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So anybody ever been disappointed in life? All hands will go up. <laughs> We've been disappointed. Okay. So I'm wondering sometimes if we have our focus sometimes on the wrong thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? So if I have, if I have, if I'm hoping for something, right? If I'm hoping for maybe even a promise of God, and that promise has not maybe come to pass. For instance, I remember my dad back in the 70s and 80s. Jesus is coming soon. Well, that's 40 some years ago. That's a long time. Is he really coming soon? He is, right? But sometimes if we're not looking at this right or perceiving this right, we'll become discouraged. For instance, in our political realm or even in America, we're going, something has got to change. Something has got to change. The church, something has got to change. And we're going, but it's not. <laughs> but it's not, right? But it is. Just because we're not seeing it, it is changing. But if we, if we focus on just the change, right, we're probably going to miss what's happening. Just as the Pharisees, just as the other people miss Jesus because they were looking at some, for something different. Okay? So we want to be focused today. We want to understand his ways, but we also want to have hope because guess what the hope? The hope of Christ Jesus. We, the prophets, spoke, right? And they spoke of the promise. They spoke of the mysteries. And the mystery of Jesus has been revealed to us. We ought to be doing the dance and jittering and all that stuff, right? Amen. Because the, re, the, the mystery has been revealed to each and every one of us. That should be exciting to each and every one of us. Amen? Man, we, we, we are winners without even trying to be winners. 
We're victorious because of Jesus. And, and you'll see that. You'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to read about that. You'll have to have knowledge about it. You'll have to have understanding about it. You'll have to have wisdom about all of these things. And that's on you. That's on your part. We search out the scriptures so that we can understand his ways. Let's go to Luke 17. When is God going to move? When is, when is this uh, thing that Jesus is talking about, the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. When is it going to happen? Okay? Luke 17, and we're going to go in verse number 20. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees at, at to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered and he said to them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Right? So we're looking with our natural eye for things to change. We're looking for things to change in our government. We're looking for things for, to change in the church. We're, we're looking for things with the natural eye. But Jesus says this, um, the kingdom is not coming with signs and wonders to be observed, nor will they say, look here or, or look here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And Jesus is standing there, right? Jesus is standing there and he's going, I'm it. But you're missing it. I'm it. It's not about the signs and wonders about me. And so even as we are, we are going out, the, the world is looking for signs and wonders. The, the church is looking for signs and wonders for Jesus to show up, for the Holy Spirit to show up, for the manifestation to show up. But it's in our midst because we are here. I, man, I, I think of this as, as we, are, we are carriers of the anointing. And you look up anointing, we're carriers of the glory of God. I, 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 I narrowed glory down to this for my thinking is that all that God is and all that God has. And he says, I give it to you. Glory. We have the ability to change the atmosphere. We have the ability to lay hands on the sick, and those signs will follow who, them who believe. Sounds far-fetched, but I'm telling you, it's happening. It's happening in our midst. It's happening through you and I. It's happening. Because I believe that when we speak, we speak in faith, knowing that the one who spoke it is the one that's going to manifest it. See, what we do, we get scared. Man, if I pray for him and he doesn't get healed, it's all on me. It's not on you. It's on him. Right? Even the word. Even the word that's boiling up inside of you. Right? Man, what if I don't know what to say after I say God? Right? Y'all been there. I don't know what to say after this. It doesn't matter. If he's in it, he will deliver. We just be subject to what he wants to do. We speak, but we're speaking out of here. We're speaking out of what he has spoken. So good. And what a great place to do it is right here. Right? Nobody has tomatoes in her. Pockets. Nobody has anything that they're going to throw at you, right? Right. But we can speak it out. That's what I love. Even about, um, we're getting better downstairs about uh, the Abundant Life class. Just, you know, letting Tammy tell her little stories. <laughs> you want to tell the car story? You want to come and tell the car story? No. Okay. Anyway, how fun. How fun. You know what I mean? Um, but it should be a safe place. To be able to, if I could say it this way, practice, right? But yet, a powerful time to be able to speak the word of God. The kingdom of God is here. So we, we, the kingdom of God is heaven is here. Christ is in us. The fullness of the Godhead lived in Jesus. And so when Jesus says this, he goes, you know, if you follow my commands and you love me, I will make my abode with you. Me and my Father and Holy Spirit will make our house your house. 
so he will live within us. Isn't that amazing? Guess what? Guess how many commands that um, Jesus spoke actually during his time in the New Testament? 1,050-ish. And if you categorized it down a little bit, there's like 800 different commands that we have been given as a Christian, as a born-again believer, to be able to follow. Anybody getting crushed yet from all the responsibility? Anybody can turn that into a law, right? But no. What's, his, what's he say? He says that I, the Father says, Jesus says, I'm going to write the law. I'm going to write my commands on your heart. It's not a piece of paper. It's not a to-do list. But it's just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not him shaking his finger at you. None of that. He said, I've called you. I want you. Let's do this. And it's not a suggestion. We don't like to be told what to do. Right? We don't like to be told what to do. But when the Holy Spirit speaks, it goes, yes, I want to do this. Because guess what? Yesterday, when, someone, when, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I did that. And oh my goodness, it was like, oh, what an awesome experience. What an awesome time. What an awesome testimony. We did a, um, Ernie Austin's funeral over here at the VFW. And Rocky's here. There, he's in the back there. I struggled <laughs> um, trying to relay. Uh, you got all kinds of different people there. You got people that are not saved, saved, and some think they're saved, and it's like, oh Lord, how do I do this, right? But you just let it go. <laughs> you just uh, follow what the Lord has already spoken to you, right? And a lady comes up afterwards. She goes, that's such a wonderful, encouraging message. Talked about just waking up tomorrow, waking up today with a new perspective. Sometimes we get stuck in life and we don't appreciate life. Because what happened, even we'll go back to that hope. Maybe, maybe you're disappointed over here, but that right there can steal your very day. Anybody remember the mango? Right? The enemy wants you to eat the rotten mango. God is giving you the good mango. But by the words of our mouth, we're choosing to eat the rotten mango. So we have an attitude change. We have a heart change. Tomorrow, when I wake up, I choose today. I choose today. I choose joy today. I choose to live for him today. I choose to be grateful today. And I choose not, I choose not to let this steal my joy. Wow. How powerful. And it's more than a mind, mind over matter thing. Your mind can do it for a while, but it ain't going to last. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. It's the truth of his word. For he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And so out of that bread, we receive life. Right? Okay. Um, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Talking about Jesus representing the Father, Jesus goes away, and now he begins to, he is my champion. He is our champion, right? Why is he our champion? Just because of the cross? No, because of him who laid down his life, and his father said, because of your obedience, I will raise you up above every name. That's why we have that authority. That's why we can say what we say. That's why we can pray the way we pray. We are champions because of Jesus. And it, it says this in Ephesians, what did I say, 1, 
122. Remember I told you last week to just go over this, just walk over this over and over and over again. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church. That's to us. We are the church. Jesus, the the authority that Jesus has, even right now, has been given to us as the church. We're waiting for Jesus to do something, and God is saying, I'm waiting for you to do something. Because we have the authority. God, and I said this a couple, three weeks ago, God manifests himself or shows himself through mankind. Through speaking, through actions, okay, through prayer, God shows himself through us. What a great privilege. So the church, okay, over all things to the church, which is his body, and the fullness, remember the fullness, right? God is not lacking anything. Jesus lacked nothing, and neither does the church. So when we talk about having the mind of Christ, we have the mind of Christ collectively. I don't want to say that because no one, right, No one is above another. But we have the mind of Christ. That's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why you should see yourself as a member of the body of Christ and the value that you have in it. You have value here in this church, in the body of Christ. Not as the church is a cult, but the church as a body. You're valuable. You're important. Your words, your actions, your service, your servanthood is amazing to the body of Christ. It's amazing. And I'll talk about that at the very, very end. Uh, So Jesus came to represent his Father and demonstrate love and grace and fellowship and service Let's go to John 14. I kind of touched on this just a little bit. I want you to see this with great value. I'm going to start in verse number 23. And I I already said this, but I want to to complete this. Um, John 14, 23. Jesus had answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. I remember Jesus was the testimony or was the witness of the Father. So the words that Jesus spoke, the testimony that we speak, are the words of the Father. The words that Jesus speaks was the word of the Father, okay? He's testifying of the Father. Um, Verse number 25, these things I have spoken to you while I was here walking around on the earth. But to your advantage, I'm going to go away, but also because I'm going away, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Okay? And here he is, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. What has he said to you? He said in his word, right? That's why it's important that we open his word and allow it to feed us the bread of life. But when we're in a situation, when we're in, in a conversation, the Holy Spirit will go, Right? Jesus loves you. You can be delivered. You can be set free. God is good. Right? We're victorious. Now, as we're turning to Mark 8, let's go to Mark 8. I'm going to be singing that song all day. 
You are my champion. Mark 8. Mind of Christ. Remember the mind of Christ. The testimony of the Lord. Jesus, in those days again, verse number 1, in those days again when there was a great multitude, again, Jesus is faced again, there, when there was a great multitude, they were, had nothing to eat. And he called his disciples and he said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Let me talk about that just in a minute. I have compassion on them. Now, sometimes our words, sometimes our words that we speak, the word compassion, um, if, if we use the word compassion, I bet you 90% of the people would um, say that it's, um, it's feeling sorry for maybe, maybe you're uh, like tender towards, uh, maybe your, your heart goes out to them, um, that type of deal. Kind of a soft explanation of compassion. So Jesus, remember, he's, he's preaching the word. He's feeding them the word, right? The, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He also says that in the word that they're the soil of the heart, okay, so these, these men, these women, these children are coming and they're following Jesus to receive the bread of life. They're receiving the word. Not only are they receiving the word, but they're seeing signs and wonders as well. Okay? Now, it's time to send them home. Three days, okay? Right? Three days. Um, my wife used to pack a lunch for me when I was uh, farming. I'd be gone all day from sunup to sundown, right? Five sandwiches she would pack for me, plus other treats. I would eat five sandwiches. By 10 o'clock in the morning, I have you say. Honestly, that's the truth, isn't it? I would, <laughs> I would eat five sandwiches a day, easily. By 10 o'clock. Okay, so anyway, so these guys or these people are coming out to hear the word of God. They're excited. And Jesus is excited to express the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. Now it's time to send them home. He has compassion on them. Now I'm going to read what compassion kind of says in a little bit of a de definition here. Compassion is when the inner man revolts against anything that is unlawful in human misery um, that it could bring deliverance. Does that sound soft and fluffy? No. Okay, Jesus, so guess what's going to happen? If he sends them home, they've got the word in them. If he sends them home, it says they're probably going to faint. And guess what's going to be on their mind? Guess what's going to be on the relative's mind? Oh my goodness, he, he's about ready to die. We need some water. What happened to the word of God? It's gone, right? So Jesus is going, no, this is not going to happen. The enemy is not going to steal the word by people being hungry. I'm going to have compassion on them. Mind of Christ, mind of the Father, right? I'm going to do something about it. Because I'm not going to let the enemy steal what God has given them. Now, I don't know if I can quote this or not, but the heaven, have it, quote it for me, Roy. Heaven something violently. Go ahead. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the, the kingdom of heaven takes it by force. So in other words, here's the deal. You remember Caleb? Remember Joshua? You remember Jericho? Remember the promise? There's the promise. You remember the promise that um, Caleb had? Mountain. That mountain right there, right over there, that's mine. He had to wait 40 years for that stinking mountain. He's 80 years old now. And he's around a bunch of grumbling, complaining people. But guess what? Every time he saw that mountain, 
And every time he didn't see that mountain, he said, that mountain's mine. Because I have a promise from my father. I have a promise from Moses even. That that mountain, that promise is mine. And I'm not going to let go of it. He had compassion. He had compassion on that promise. He revolted against what the enemy was trying to take away from him. Forty stinking years. Anybody ever, ever, anybody ever been waiting for a promise for more than six months? Right? Right? Forty years. He said, I'm not letting it go. For God has promised me that. So when they go in and the, uh, the Jordan River opens up, guess who they face? Jericho. What? They have to come and fight against you. The promise. The promise is mine. But guess what? They had to fight to get it. The Lord fought for them, but they had to fight. You have to fight for your promise. By faith. By proclaiming that promise. By not losing heart. By not losing hope. Because what? Here's the deal. When God speaks something, God is a man of integrity. When he speaks it, therefore I can trust him. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. I have faith in him. I'm not looking at the promise per se. I'm looking at him who gives the promise. Who is the promise? Jesus is the promise. Here's the other thing, right? So if I can trust Jesus, that he died and he rose again, and the promise lives within me, if I can trust that, right? I can trust that because I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I sense in my very being that God, when God says something, something inside leaps inside of me. Holy Spirit, we're sealed. We're confirmed by that. So when he speaks a promise, man, just as he promised Jesus, he promised this as well. And you can stand on it. You can stay on it. You can trust him in that promise. Amen? Amen. Why would we lose hope? We lose hope because we fix our eyes on this rather than the one who spoke the promise. Oh my, that's good. Fix your eyes on him, the hope of glory, who is the promise. He is the promise. Amen. Now, so Jesus, right, he feels compassion. I'm going to do something about this. Okay? How many ever had an unction to help somebody, but the unction was probably about this much, and it never got done? We've all done that, right? But compassion, go in Mark, and I, I just challenge you this week. Go in Mark and mark down all the times that Jesus went alone to pray. He got away, he got alone, and then mark down, I put a circle when he went to pray, I put a check mark from the results of that prayer. When he went to pray, I don't know what he prayed, but he prayed. Something happened. He had compassion. He healed the sick. He, right? So are we spending time with the Father? Are we spending time with him to have our heart moved in such a way that we believe the promise? that we believe what he says about that situation, that he will, um, he will bring to pass those things which he has said. Maybe he's, some, he, maybe he's spoken something to you in the secret hour or the secret spot, whatever it may be, and that's burning in here, being developed in here. You and I spend time that that thing can be birthed it's like a baby in her tummy. It's being, it's being developed, right? And one day, it's birthed because of the promises of God. And guess what? There's pains when there's birth. When there's birthing, there's pains. But you don't remember the pain. You remember the baby, the birth, the promise. 
Amen? So don't fix your eyes on the, on the troubles. Don't fix your eyes on what? Fix your eyes on Him, who is the promise. Okay, here we go. Uh, so Jesus, right, is here. And um, in verse number three, and if I send them away to their home, they will faint on their way, and some of them have come from a great distance. And as the church would say, we don't have what it takes to feed them, right? Verse number five, Jesus says this, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. We don't, they probably didn't know that then, but seven has some meaning to it. When Jesus says, or when they recognize that the word seven or the number seven is up, they ought to be dancing. Because <laughs> something's going to happen. And something's happening in the heavenlies. Here we are. Seven. Completeness. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground and, take, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and he broke them and he started giving them to his disciples to serve them. And they served them to the multitude. Now, here's the deal. Seven loaves, right? He's got 12 disciples or maybe more, I don't know. So anyway, we know the 12 main. So he takes the bread and what's he do with it? He takes what he has, he begins to break it. What do we, what do we want? We want to see the pile of loaves and then we'll take from that and then we'll give to people. He takes and he begins to break the small become the miraculous, okay? The mind of Christ, remember? And we'll get to that at the end. Here we are. Take the seven loaves, and he directed the multitude to sit down. He began to break them, verse number seven, and they also had a few small fish. After he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate, and they were satisfied, and they picked up seven right? Seven large baskets uh, that was left over of the broken pieces. There was about 4,000 of them there. Okay? Now, seven loaves, a few fish. If you go back a story or two, two stories, not just stories to entertain us, but we will see that Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's in verse uh, uh, chapter 6. So he um, has them sit down again, and he starts with what? He starts with, uh, he feeds these 7,000, or 5,000, so he has five loaves and two fish, five loaves, two fish, and he feeds 5,000. What's left over? Twelve baskets. It just doesn't calculate out, does it? After that, he only had seven baskets. Had kind of probably a little bit more to start with. Okay? Now, there's a principle in here that we'll talk about in just a minute. So, if you think about this, in our life, we think we have to be the greatest. But what does the Bible say? What does the, what's the spiritual law say? Those who will be least will be greatest. Right? Jesus fed the 5,000 with less and had a greater amount left over. And he fed more with less. We think we have to have this much to do this. No. Right? Trusting Jesus. He trusted his Father. And he actually applied a principle, right? A spiritual law as well. Those who, who be least will be greatest. That's why he talks about the children. Right? Whoever comes to me as a little child, are we coming to him as a little child? Or are we not?
I want us to go to chapter 8 again, and I'll finish with this. It's in verse 12. So he ends up with the baskets left over, seven. And the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Verse number 12. And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, now, what did they just see? I just saw a miracle. That's the trouble with searching for signs and wonders. You're just looking for another sign. You're looking for another confirmation. You're looking for another whatever, right? You're never satisfied if you're looking for signs, okay? But if you know him, you don't need signs because signs are following you. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, and sighing deeply in his spirit, he says, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Remember, I used that illustration last week about uh, an acorn seed, right? We have an acorn seed. We plant it. We think there's going to be a tree coming up. But when Jesus sees an acorn seed, he already sees the oak tree. Do you see the oak tree? Or do you need to see the, what's that, seedling begin to grow? Mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Right? The Father spoke things into existence. Imagine, it's in your mind, in a good way. Now, here it is. And leaving them, he again embarked and went uh, away to the other side. And the Pharisees, here we go again, and they had forgotten to take bread and did not have um, more than one loaf in the boat with them. One loaf will feed about how many people? A thousand people, probably, 500 people. Basically, because seven loaves feed it, fed 4,000, right? Okay. And that's just men, okay? There's men and children. Here we are. Um, and Jesus says this. And he was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out, for beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Okay? And they're questioning himself, and they're going, Dude, is it about us not bringing bread? Or is it, what, is, what is this all about? You know what I mean? Did you bring the bread? I didn't bring bread. Did you bring No, I didn't bring bread. Well, what's, what's he asking this question for, right? So here we are. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven, a picture of sin because it's added to the dough. You remember when, um, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had their dough going, right? But they didn't, it didn't have time to rise. So it was not leavened bread. It was bread that didn't have time to rise. Didn't have the yeast in it. So we have to be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. So in other words, here we are again. The enemy wants to steal what's true about God, the testimony of God. So the, the, the enemy wants us to move into a place of religion or the law. Have you ever had, and, and you got to be careful on this, have you ever had a promise from the Lord and you speak that promise to somebody and they go, oh, that's such a wonderful idea. Hope it goes well for you and walk away. They really don't believe that it's going to happen. We have to remember who we share our dream with, right? Or vision. But the enemy or the Pharisee or religion wants to minimize the things of God. They just do. It twists it. I talked about it earlier. 10, or 1,050 commands. Holy smokes, that's a lot, that's a lot of commands, right? But Jesus gave us freedom right? Because he wrote it on our heart. And therefore, we just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But we read that, but we, so we know his ways, but it's not 
overwhelming. But religion says you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. You have to sing a song out of this book. You have to read the Bible out of this translation. You have to come to church this many times. You have to kneel, sit. You have to sing this song. Here it is. <laughs> and guess what? There's no power in it. There is no power in it. The power comes from freedom. The power comes, those who are in Christ are, are free. There's, I'm, I'm looking for another one here. Um, but anyway, freedom is in Christ Jesus. The disciples... Uh, um, give me a second. Those who, um, my disciples will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. Jesus will set you free. Religion will put you in bondage. Religion will keep you in bondage. Religion will make you powerless. So Jesus is just saying, hey, we just, we just saw the power of, the, of God ministering to the people through those loaves in a physical way, and you're back into saying, I don't know if this can happen. We only have one loaf, right? So how easy our mind is to go back to the old way. Our mind is uh, so easy to go back to doubt and unbelief. Last one. Beware of the leaven of, of Herod. So here it is. We think, in America, we think, as a church, we think, as a general, as a whole, that the government is going to fix everything. That man is going to fix it. We really don't need God. I mean, honestly, we really don't think we need God. In fact, we kick prayer out of the school thinking, we don't really need that in there. I mean, we've we got to be careful in that area, okay, because we can get really religious there as well. But prayer is powerful. Right? God is powerful through prayer. Because he's changing men and women's hearts. Right? He's giving you compassion to do something. He's giving you a desire. He's giving you a tenacity through prayer. Right? And instruction through prayer to do something. That's effective. Now, prayer gets a bad rap as well. So, okay? We won't go down that trail. But here's the deal. We think Herod, right? Herod or the government, or whoever is going to fix things. No. You cannot have that mindset. The church cannot have that mindset. We are the kingdom of heaven. We are here to make a difference. We are here to speak the truth of God's word. And guess what? One by one, one by one, one by one. The disciples, right? Turned the world upside down, basically. Or right side up. There you go. We can do the same. But we're so reliant on our government. That doesn't mean that we go against government or whatever, whatever, okay? But God is the answer, not mankind. Man is not the answer. Jesus, through man... God, uh, Jesus through us will change the world. Are we ready? Do we have compassion for our generation? Do we have compassion for our community? Prayer, the word, truth, knowing his ways. What does God want? He wants revival. He wants people to be revived. He wants the church to be revived. He wants people to be born again in our community. I just look at it myself and the fact that, and it's not all my responsibility, and it's not all your responsibility, but where are the people who need Jesus, why aren't they here? Why didn't we have a hand go up that said, man, 
two days ago, six months ago, I gave my life to the Lord. They're out there. They need Jesus. They're crying for us to help them. But we get all twisted in their sin. We get twisted in, you know, uh, I don't want to mess with that. Let Pastor Dom do that. Let somebody else do that. No. I have called you to be disciples. I have called you to be disciples. When's the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? Not preaching at him, you know. Just showing the kindness of God. Talking about the kindness of God. Talking about your story. Talking about what he's done for you. Tell them about a miracle that's happened. Wow. Man. You know, I was this. but Somehow, man, I have a different attitude. I have different actions. I have different desires. That's us. Father, today we thank you that you are our champion. Lord, I thank you that you have given us the ability, Father, to... Proclaim the gospel to display your ways. What, what a great opportunity, Lord God, to go out into our community, the community that you've placed us in, but also the community that you've blessed us with. We are blessed to live in Glasgow, Montana. We're blessed to live in Valley County. We're blessed to live in Montana. We're blessed to live in America, Lord. We're blessed to be alive at this moment in time in history. For such a time as this, you've been appointed for this generation. God, I pray that today we would take it seriously. The value that you have placed on us because of you. God, we want to make a difference. We want to have compassion like Jesus had compassion. He was willing to cross barriers, culture barriers. He was willing to cross, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Gender, gender barriers, Lord. He was willing to go against what religion was trying to do. God, I thank you, Lord. I repent of being religious. God, I just pray that you just continue to rise up the church. Lord, we just take a breath even right now and say, breathe on me, Holy Spirit. Even as Joel prophesied, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon my all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And even as we speak, Father, we speak prophecy. We speak those things over our life, Lord God, not as signs and wonders, but to rise up within us, Lord God, to bring breath, to bring life. Even as Ezekiel spoke to those dry bones, live. And we speak life right now over Glasgow, Montana. We speak life. We say, we say live Dry bones, live in the name of Jesus. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Why don't you give the Lord a clap offering, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.